you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Boss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Welcome to the big show. We certainly appreciate you guys being here. Thanks for tuning in, as always. Well, we've got an amazing author on the show, and she's a woman who's going to tell us quite an interesting journey and help us understand what's going on over in China and with uh, her group that's over there of people that are suffering through some of the concentration camps and re-education camps that unfortunately they call them and and uh some of the suffrages that are going on there as well and stories about her family a memoir of her exile hope and survival the book is entitled a stone is most precious where it belongs a memoir of uh Uyghur, uh exile hope and survival she joins us on the show today and she's uh, said to i can uh, call her by her nickname goo so we'll do that on the show uh, and it just came out february 21st 2023 i've always been curious about this topic i hope you are as well because uh there seems to be a whole new thing going on of a repression of people and uh, putting them into camps and everything else and i thought we'd overthrown stuff like this in the 40 in the world war ii but uh, the horrors of, of uh, oppressing people seem to keep returning. So we're going to talk to her about her book and her memoir and everything else today. Uh, she is a journalist based in the United States and has earned honors such as the 2019 Magnits, Magnits, Magnitsky uh, Human Rights Award. I know how to say Magnitsky. Uh, the Magnitsky Human Rights Award, the Courage and Journalism Award, from the International Women's Media Foundation in 2020, recognition of one of the most 500 influential Muslims in the world every year since 2016, and an appearance in the 2020 Oslo Freedom Forum. Her work has been featured in the Washington Post, Financial Times, and many other publications. Welcome, Shogu. How are you? Hi, Chris. Thank you for having me. I'm such an honor to be here. <laughs> And it's an honor to have you as well. Congratulations. And give me the full pronunciation of your name uh, as, as it is. Gülçehra Hoja. There you go. There you go. I love that you say that. You say it more beautifully than I do. Thank you. Just call me Gül. It's more comfortable for me and for you too. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. So uh, give us the dot coms, websites, uh, social media accounts, wherever you want people to follow you on the interwebs, please. Yeah, just my name, Gulchekra Hoja, at the Twitter, also Facebook. There you go. And so uh, what motivated you want to write this book? It seems obvious, but, you know, people like to hear it from the author themselves. Um, you know, um, we Uyghurs, about um, more than 20 millions of uh, people, actually, we believe that a number um, uh, China use is not correct. Hmm. So more than 20 million Uyghur people living in Uyghur region, which is China called <clears throat> Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Uh, we prefer call our, uh, you know, the country name as uh, East Turkestan. Um, our country occupied by CCP in 90. Uh, 49. Uh, since then, we lost our freedom. Mm -hmm. So recently, um, because of the concentration camp and the genocide um, uh, going on in my country, that's why the whole world actually media start to paying attention to um, the atrocity going on in my land. So, but uh, unfortunately, only sees us, Uyghur people, as a victim of genocide. Mm -hmm. So, being a Uyghur, it's a, uh, how can I say? It? It's it's like shame for us. Of course, we are living in that country thousands of years, 
And we are very proud of um, who we are, actually, our culture, our history, everything about Uyghur. So I am also uh, grown up, uh, such a family taught me a lot um, to be honored and be grateful for who you are, who mm -hmm. your real identity. So being a Uyghur is a, such a beautiful and honor thing for me. Also today, we have the painful, you know, experiences that, but I want to, you know, show the world uh, who are the Uyghurs really are. So I just um, wrote the book uh, from my experience, my perspective. So it just wants to helping people to more understand uh, the Uyghurs. There you go. And I think this is important because more people and more light needs to be shined on what's going on over there in China. Mm -hmm. Uh, more, uh, more concern, and it, it, I don't know what more uh, can be done. That's at a that's beyond my pay grade, but definitely we need to have more outcry and more understanding mm -hmm. of what goes on. Um, you entitled the book "A Stone yeah. Is Most Precious Where It Belongs." What's the origin of that? Um, you know, this uh, tash can hear the as is this uh proverb right um a stone is most precious with where it belongs we usually um uh use this word to describe about um the people who forcedly separate with their countries mm -hmm. and their um homeland their uh, birthplace so mm -hmm. Uh, this is the another point uh, that has uh, greatly inspired me to begin to writing this book because of my exile life. I really uh, lived through the deep values of this proverb, mm -hmm. so I picked that name. I and, like it. Uh, yeah, and it has a very beautiful story about. Oh. Uh, this pro warp, mm -hmm. um, how it inspired me because um, my father used to um, use this word a lot, and also he sent me uh, when when he sent me first um, box from home. Uh, he actually put one stone, this stone the very random stone from our neighborhood. <laughs> he put that in that um, gift box. And when I opened it, um, I saw one uh, doppa, is Uyghur hat inside, and the one letter from my parents, and the one homemade bread, which is my mom, mm -hmm. uh, handmade bread, and then this stone together. <laughs> And I was wondering, okay, they they think about, yeah, um, may I, I may very uh, missed, you know, about the nun, the the bread, homemade bread, and this dopa presents Uyghur culture. They want to, um, you know, me keep up our tradition alive, but I couldn't understand why they put the. Uh, the stone inside. So I was thinking because my father usually just give us message or deep be meaning of um, stuff with his act, something he doesn't directly tell you. He wants to to think and deeply understand. That's why I naturally uh, thinking about why he put this uh, stone in that box and I just think all related with a stone, right? So I immediately, you know, the proverb, which is Tash Shkenyer the Aziz, come to my mind and I called my dad. I said, thank you for your gifts. It's very beautiful. And, but you uh, send me a stone also. Is that the mean 
a stone is most precious where it belongs. And my father was so happy <laughs> to see, <laughs> you know, I deeply understand that. That's why I keep that stone with me. I already moved seven times in the United States, but the stone for me is the part of my home, part of my homeland. That's why I keep that with me all the time. And when I move, I, I afraid of lost that, you know. So it's uh, actually in this 22 years, it's uh, the most precious um, stuff for me um, mm -hmm. in my entire exile life. So it's also sits in my behind, <laughs> you know, my uh, bookshelf also. Uh -huh. When I miss my family, miss my home, I hold it and I will smell it. It still have that smell from home. <laughs> there you go. Well, that's a beautiful story. And what a wise father. I like the father who makes people think, you know. And He's always like that, yeah. Yeah, because my dad would just tell me things. And I'd just be like, yeah, whatever, dad. But, uh, <laughs> you know, the whole thinking through it and the beauty of it. And he probably knew that. You know, having having a part of your country to always have with you uh, and yes. things. So uh, tell us just a little bit about how you ended up in America in exile. But what, what's the life journey and in, in some of the stuff that you put in your memoir? Yeah, I grew up in the uh, Urumqi city, which is uh, the capital of our country, is Turkestan. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my early um, uh, beginning with, with a TV life uh, career, actually, uh, in a state-run TV called Xinjiang TV in Uyghur region, and I was pretty, um, uh, <laughs> you know, um, just like a star, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, because I create the first ever Uyghur children show in Uyghur TV. Mm -hmm. And the very uh, quickly become uh, a star who everyone knows. Uh, mm -hmm. After five years working as a journalist and a TV host in Xinjiang TV, I witnessed so many um, propaganda because I deeply understand uh, we don't have actually freedom of speech, freedom of express in China. Mm -hmm. All the media is tool uh, of uh, propaganda for uh, CCP to use to brainwash people. Mm -hmm. Also, including my uh, children program from 2020, they changed the education system for just using Han Chinese uh, mm -hmm. to reduce the Uyghur language teaching in all the school. Mm -hmm. And they also order us to propaganda about if your child um, learning Han Chinese, their future will be bright, you know. So those kind of stuff. And when, when you loved by your people, you earn their trust after you brainwash their kids. It's for me like burden, it's uh, hurting. Mm -hmm. I work with very heavy, like a guilty feeling since then. Then during that hard time, I had the opportunity to visit um, Europe. Mm -hmm. It was 2001 in summer. So I went to Europe. That's the first time I had a freedom to um, explore the internet <laughs> freely. Oh. So I searching up what's going on outside of Uyghur region, what the exiled Uyghurs doing. So I search and I search up the uh, Radio Free Asia website and I listen to their uh, news reports. It's a totally different from what I was working, you know. So yeah. I, I feel like I am not the journalist, actually. They are journals. So mm -hmm. I, w I want to speak the truth. I want to, I because I love my job. But I if I go back, I forcibly 
could do more to for the Chinese government propaganda. Yeah. So I was, you know, changed my mind. Mm -hmm. By that time, I I feel like no, I cannot go back. So mm -hmm. I apply to Radio Free Asia, and they happily and very fastly, uh, um, you know, uh, accept me because they mm -hmm. know me, and also they were very happy. So, but uh, during, you know, the just about to go to the U.S. Embassy in Vienna, the boom, the September 11 happened. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I was stuck in the Vienna one month. Mm -hmm. And that time, all uh, U.S. embassies shut down because of the war. And um, after one month, Finally, I came to United States. Uh, it was 20, uh, 2001 um, mm -hmm. in October. Mm -hmm. I start uh, my new career as a real journalist in the RFA since then. Wow. And so, <laughs> and so uh, you've, have you, you've never been able to return to your country? No. Since then. Yeah. And that's kind of be challenging. It is. It is hard. And, uh, you know, but my father used to teach us, um, you know, for the freedom, everything mm -hmm. you can, um, how can I uh, translate that? Um, nothing is valuable without freedom. He always said that. Wow. That's why I was... Um, you know, achieving my dream. Um, yeah. But it was, um, we paid a lot, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Yes, I I reached my freedom of um, speech, uh, my freedom in the uh, United States. But for that, my family members are paying tremendous, uh, you know, price since mm -hmm. then. And Chinese government, uh, you know, immediately, um, announced the um, red notes after me mm -hmm. that time and they erase all my records that time i had many tv oh. shows and the uh, movies and some uh, commercials also playing china's tv mm -hmm. uh, they stop all and uh, actually uh, remove all wow. my pictures and my voices from their data mm -hmm. and um, especially my family targeted by Chinese government. And yep. Wow. That's unfortunate. And, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really an interesting, um, I'm not sure if interesting is the proper word, but it's an interesting relationship that the United States has with China, where we have this sort of kosher trade agreement, but then, there's these uh, horrors going on in China. There's repressing people like like your people, and then uh, you know we're we have this sort of deton of war. It's kind of weird. It's a, it's a really complex sort of situation. So tell us a little bit more for people that don't understand uh, who the Uyghur people are. Why haven't most Americans heard of them? Why aren't we better educated? Uh, what's their religious background, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as I told you, uh, more than 20 million people mm -hmm. living in far west in China. It's uh, in uh, Central Asia. We are uh, close to uh, neighbor with Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan. Also, uh, here's Tibet, Mongolia, uh, like eight, nine countries around us, including China. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, since after our country occupied by Chinese government, they uh, renamed our country as the Xinjiang Afternoon, uh, Uyghur Afternoon Region. But in our country, uh, other than Uyghurs, we have uh, Kazakh, Kyrgyz, Tajik, Uzbek, other Turkic speaking um, minorities, also mm -hmm. Muslim. Uh, we Uyghurs um, uh, 
you know, convert to Islam about thousand years. So our culture uh, is mixed with Islamic culture also. It's a mm -hmm. very rich Turkic background. Mm -hmm. So it's a rich of the uh, oil, natural resources. And uh, that's why Chinese government, um, you know, using all our natural resources, may have been many years, uh, never the benefit to the local people. And uh, they uh, lack of, you know, development many years. Mm -hmm. uh, they just beginning really um, develop this uh, region after 1990, but for the migrant Chinese people to oh, wow. comfortably live there. So they use uh, the migrant policy from 1990 very, you know, frequently move many millions of Chinese people so our um, population uh, before that is like 80 90 percent we were living there right now you can see is like same like 40 something we were 40 something uh, Chinese and uh, including other uh, minorities there and uh, they uh, crack down Uyghurs using different different uh, tools um, different names you know, they also using like um, uh, anti-terrorists, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to punish Uyghur because we are Muslim, but we never had terrorism in our region. Uh, and they even doesn't allow Uyghurs to really practice their religion because, you know, the CCP is atheist, a uh, communist country. They hate all the uh, religious, uh, afraid of, you know, people to obey uh, mm -hmm. than the CCPs. That's why they punish all Uyghur people. But we have very strong connection and the lineage with our religion. So somehow people survive with their uh, mm -hmm religion and their culture until uh, in 2016 uh, Xi Jinping used no mercy policy toward the Uyghurs to wow. uh, start the re-education program mm -hmm. and uh, many other uh, deploying uh, the law to crack down Uyghurs so uh, as a journalist uh, also speaking Uyghur language. Um, so we actually uh, focusing on those issues uh, in our Radio Free Asia, in our daily news, we publish about those. Mm -hmm. That's why not only me, my uh, colleagues, uh, family members back home also targeted. So some of them also sentenced many years. Uh, so its situation is very bad for me. I heard first my brother, my younger brother, arrested because of my my work. Oh, wow. um, Go. I think we may have lost some of the internet here. Let's see. Let's see if we can get her back. The internet stuff is always fun. And hopefully we'll get her back and returning. This has uh, been a uh, interest of mine for quite some time because, you know, seeing these people that are 
suffering over there. They're going through the re-education camps, if you're familiar with them. If you've seen the pictures of these detainees, basically what they call reprogramming camps. And really what they are is concentration camps. They've been sterilizing women uh, or making it so they can't have birth uh, and, you know, have sons and daughters raised in in uh, Islam. Uh, so it's uh, it's quite horrific. I never, you, you wouldn't think that something like this would be happening in 2023, but, you know, look what else is going on in the world, uh, wars in Ukraine, Russia, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so... Um, but this is one of the things uh, that I always say on the show, we don't learn from history, so we're doomed to repeat it. So this is why it's important to cover these things. Um, let me see if we can't communicate with her on a back channel. Uh, let's see. Hopefully we can get her back. It may have been her internet skipping out. Uh, There she is. Hi, welcome back. Oh, sorry for the internet connection. Is no there. problem at all. This is this is what happens in today's world of all the stuff. Um, Here it was <laughs> start to, you know, missing. <laughs> All good. So uh, we were. Uh, what we'll do is in the final edit, we'll cut it up, and and nothing, no one will know what happened. Okay. Um, so uh, you started talking to me about what your. I think your brother. You were saying your brother was has was arrested. starting to pay for. He was arrested. Mm -hmm. So let's get into some of that. So tell us about that. Yeah, in two thousand seventeen, uh, finally we uh, speak with the first. Um, camp survivor who willing to speak to the media who wow. is um, Umar Bek Ali, half Kazakh, half uh, Uyghur. Uh, he was um, released from the camp, uh, went to Almaty, and uh, I interview him from uh, a phone interview him from the Almaty, Kazakhstan, and I released that news. I believe it's uh, January twenty eighth. Mm -hmm. That's the shocking news because he uh, detailed described uh, the camps, actually camps, and he is actually a Kazakh citizen, also a Chinese citizen, dual citizenship. Um, that's why Kazakh government had to, you know to him to escape from the camp. Um, so he gave us very detailed information after we released that news. Wow. I assume because of that news. Mm -hmm. uh, and then my all parents um, and siblings and cousins all together arrested in fe uh, February wow. 1st in the one night. Mm -hmm. So after my brother arrested, also I lost all my family members in one night. That's why from that day I stood up to speak out and telling my own story to the mm -hmm. world, to the old media. There you go, and, and that's very brave. Do, do you uh, do you know where any of them are now? Yeah, after. Because I um, testified in front of Congress shortly, mm -hmm. and they released my mom. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, because of my aunt also developed mental health problem in the camp, they released her after two years mm -hmm. and released my brother recently, like about mm -hmm. a, a year. My father in that time was uh, really sick because of stroke he had uh, the half body paralyzed he mm. was in the hospital in uh, intensive room but they couldn't uh, move him to the camp because they don't have proper uh, you know health stuff to keep him alive maybe that's why they keep him in the hospital like mm -hmm. hostage and the, and after that, they're home, but just like hostage at home, they cannot go anywhere without uh, 
the government um, issue some kind of paper wow. <laughs> to letting them to even go to sick, you mm -hmm. know, the because they are very sick, they need um, to uh, to go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. Even that, they cannot go freely. Wow. They're all at home, three of them. Mm -hmm. Thank have you, God they're alive. Yeah, that's that's wow. good. Uh, have you been able to communicate with them? Are you able to call yeah, them in I any way, shape, or form? I call them because of, uh, thank you for, I'm very grateful for lawmakers who make it happen. Mm -hmm. Several of them uh, wrote the letter to the Chinese embassy uh, and then the Chinese government to ask, about my parents' uh, mm -hmm. well-being and the, because of their demand, so they allowed us to communicate just use by uh, just use mm -hmm. phone. So I can have a phone conversations only with my mother uh, once a while, like one two time uh, a month, mm -hmm. just for asking, you know, how they are. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good that you can. You know, you should be able to communicate with them at will. And at least I know on. where they are and yeah. how they are. Yeah, I'm yeah. very grateful for that. But um, as you know, right now <clears throat> in the exile, every Uyghur have uh, their parents or siblings uh, in the concentration camp, you can say, and they lost contact since 2016 with back home. Mm -hmm. So it's very painful. It's the most painful you know, the feeling if you don't know about their, you know, alive or not. And the feeling of guiltiness, you know, the Chinese government even uh, just arresting them because of they have children uh, went to other countries to yeah. study or work. Yeah. So uh, who's living in abroad today, the exile Uyghurs, all have the same pain. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I, I can I consider myself is luckier one. <laughs> yeah. Uh this is the largest scale detention of an ethnic and religious minority since World War Two. Yep. Uh they estimate uh, since two thousand seventeen some sixteen thousand mosques, churches. Uh, technically, have been raised or damaged. Hundreds of thousands of children have been forcibly separated from their mothers and sent to boarding schools. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite the atrocity. I mean, they're yes. they they they're trying to reprogram men. They call it in concentration camps. They've made it so that uh, basically sterilize women so they can't have children. Um, it, it's horrific when you hear a lot of the human rights abuses and things that are going yeah. on, ethnic and religious abuses that are going on by the communist party unfortunately this atrocity genocide is still going on mm -hmm. yeah. even you can uh count from the 2017 of uh, the six years past so the 21st century genocide is happening in front of our eyes wow and and uh, yeah, but the good part is is you're writing a book, you're speaking out. You, I've seen uh, uh, many interviews that you've given on this, and you're drawing a lot of uh, you're drawing a lot of light onto this subject and getting people aware of it, which I think is the important part of your book as well. Not only is telling your story, but uh, you know, and this is a journey of exile, hope, and survival. What do you hope um, is the future? for the Uyghur people? You know, we still feel we are not doing enough mm -hmm. and the world didn't do enough, especially the leader of all those uh, democratic countries, mm -hmm. uh, Islamic countries, they, they didn't really trying to stop this genocide. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and all through for this uh, individual like me, uh, exile, we mm -hmm. were um, taken away from their homeland and their people, language and the cultural environment. Mm -hmm. uh, 
they're still fighting for the existence, you know, because uh, in homeland, all Uyghurs and other Turkic ethnicity, um, entire people facing um, existence. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's like our duty to keep our dignity, our culture, our um, hope alive. This is at least we can do right now. Mm -hmm. um, by writing this book, I also intend to tell uh, the world, uh, the generation who is, you know, watching this um, most, you know, uh, how can I say, it? the the sad time in the history and should have sense of, you know, um, we are the same people. We all have a responsibility to stop this genocide because um, uh, you know, we are just like flowers in earth uh earth we can say is in the garden we are just different flowers to make this uh world more uh beautiful together mm -hmm. and um in order to make it even beautiful we need to live and uh, devote ourselves like flower <laughs> so um, you may remember or tell others what I have uh, briefly said here. Mm -hmm. I hope it will uh, shine beauty and the hope into you and others as well. There you go. There you go. And a beautiful story about your life and your journey and the challenges that you go through. And uh, I hope someday that somehow this can be fixed, that what's going on in China. I don't know how. I don't know, you know, this this is to power is much bigger than I, but hopefully yeah. it will and and hopefully you will bring uh more awareness and more uh people point. That, yes. that will stand up and say, <clears throat> Hey, this is BS. We shouldn't be allowing this to happen and all that good stuff. Uh so thank you very much for coming on the show, Gu. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much to thank having you. me. Thank, thank you. you. Uh give us your dot coms or wherever you want people to find you on the interwebs as well. Mm -hmm. Also, you can, uh, you know, search up rfa.org uh, to Uyghur News. Uh, much more you can learn from that, our uh, website. Mm -hmm. Also, we have English uh, translated uh, news about Uyghurs, uh, what's going on in my country right now, in China and the Uyghur region. And... Uh, Gulchehra uh, Hoja at uh, Facebook and Twitter as well. There you go. There you go. So, folks, order up the book wherever fine books are sold. A Stone is Most Precious, Where It Belongs. Uh, you can order wherever fine books are sold. February 21st, 2023, A Story of Exile, Hope, and Survival. I, it's, it's really important to understand the story, what's going on over there. I mean, the largest, the largest scaled detention of ethnic and religious minorities since world war ii i mean this is this is larger than the horror that was uh, done to the jews um you know this is something we need to call out and try and support and and uh and uh, support human rights so thank you very much goo for coming on the show we really appreciate it really thank you thank you so much Thank you. And thanks so much for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com for just Chris Voss, youtube.com for just Chris Voss, and all those crazy places on the internet. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. We'll see you guys next time.